Take out the uh, tan insert in your bulletin. You know, last week we began, began this series on getting closer to God by talking about connecting with the Father, with, our, with God. And, and there are two primary ways that we connect with Him. One is through prayer that we focused on last week. And, and then secondly is the Bible, which is going to be our focus today. I want to talk to you about how to feed ourselves from God's Word. Because until you learn to feed yourself from God's Word, you're never going to be able to grow to be all that God wants you to be. Jesus said people need more than bread for their life. They also need the Word of God. In fact, he says they must feed on the Word of God. The truth is, many of you come to church and yet your spiritual infants. You've been believers for many years, but you've grown very little in your relationship with God because you've been depending on second-hand sources like sermons and Bible studies and tapes and classes and other things because you don't know how to feed yourself from God's Word. See, if you really want to get close to Him, you've got to spend time with Him every day. As a human being, one of the marks of growth is learning how to feed yourself. You stop being fed by your parents, and you learn to feed yourself. And that's a mark of growth. And a colony eventually happens, you know, when that baby will stop, you know, will learn to feed itself. And that's growth. And, you know, that's true in the spiritual life as well. God told the Christians in Corinth, you've been Christians for a long time now. You ought to be teaching others. Instead, you still need somebody to teach you. You're like babies who drink only milk and cannot eat solid food. We've got to learn to feed ourselves the Word of God if we're ever going to grow. And so this weekend, I'm going to teach you how to do that using a very simple method of Bible study. But before we do that, I want to point out a couple of things. Number one, if I'm going to grow in my relationship with Jesus, I've got to accept the Bible as my authority for life. See, how you approach the Bible will determine how much you get out of it. If you approach the Bible as a skeptic, then you're going to, it's going to be a closed book to you. If you approach the Bible with a humble and open heart, willing to learn from God, he will just open his heart to you. Jesus promised, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching. See, God says, when you look for me with all your heart, you will find me. When we're all in, when we're wholeheartedly committed to do his will, we'll both get to know him and we'll get to know his word. See, it's the only book, the only book ever written that you can actually talk with the author while you're reading it. And when you learn to do that, you're going to get a lot more out of it. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, we thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as as it actually is, the word of God, which also performs, well, well, That's a different translation. This one says, which is at work in you who believe. The Bible claims to be the Word of God. That means it's different from every other book. If you walk in my office, you'll see hundreds of books in my library. Good books. And then there's the book, God's Word. And it is inspired in a way that no other book is inspired. The Apostle Paul says it is God-breathed. In other words, every word in this book came from God. Yes, he used human individuals to record it, but it came directly from God himself. And before you can ever really understand the Bible, you've got to accept its authority. Now, here's the thing. Everybody has to decide what's going to be their authority in life because each of us has an authority in life, what we depend upon for our decision-making. You have to have an authority for what's true for what's right, for what's good. I believe one reason there's so much confusion in this world today is because we have competing authorities. In fact, I think that, that most people, most people have four unreliable authorities that they use to determine what is good, what is right, what is true, what is valuable. The first one is culture. I know there's a typo on your outline, so just, we always put those in there just for people that like to, you know, be critical, all right? Uh, I just noticed that the other day, though, when I was working on this. Just because everybody's doing it 
doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. In Noah's day, or as our friend on the, on the video would say, in Pharaoh's day, <laughs> yeah, everybody was doing it, right? And everybody but Noah was wrong. It didn't matter what the culture did. They were all wrong, and God sent a flood and started all over with humanity. The Bible says, do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. Destruction is certain for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, and that's our culture. We've got people all over in the newspapers, on television, saying that right is wrong and wrong is right. You can't trust culture because what's in this week will be out next week. What was popular you know, this year will, will not be popular next year. And if you build your life on culture being the authority, you're going to be as unstable as a ship in a hurricane. Uh, on the other hand, God's word never changes. His truth is timeless. In fact, it's been around forever. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But you can't rely on culture's constantly changing values for your authority in life about what's right. The second source of authority that's unreliable is tradition. Now, tradition is not a bad thing at all. Many things became traditions because they worked, and they worked well at a particular time. But Jesus accused the people of his day, you abandon the commandments of God to follow human traditions. We don't want ever that ever to happen here at Valley View. We always want to base what we do on the Word of God and never on human traditions. A third incomplete source of authority is human reason. Again, reason is good. God gave us a mind so that we can communicate with him, communicate with one another, so that we can use it to think. But human reasoning is to be the discerner of authority, not the source of our authority. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and never rely on what you think you know. Remember the Lord in everything you do, and he will show you the right way. His word will show you. I really like the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases that in the message. He says, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's, he's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God, run from evil. Listen to what the Bible says. A real warning against just human reasoning. There is a path that seems right, but it's the, in the end is death. And it says that twice in the book of Proverbs. So we don't base our moral decisions on, on culture or, or tradition or on our own reason or even on what I think is the most popular false authority today, emotion. If it feels good, do it. Some of you will remember the song Debbie Boone sang years ago called You Light Up My Life. And in that song, she says, it, it can't be wrong if it feels so right. You know, I've studied Greek and Hebrew. There's a great Hebrew word for that, hogwash. <laughs> it can't be wrong if it feels so right. The problem is feelings can lie. You can be fooled by a feeling. In fact, you're fooled by feelings all the time. And I can guarantee you, that if you live purely on the basis of your feelings as your authority in life, you will seldom be living in the will of God. In the Bible, the very worst time in the history of God's people, when everything was falling apart, God gives the reason. He says, at that time, there was no king in Israel, no authority, and people did whatever they felt like doing. And that's a recipe for disaster. Do not follow your heart. If by heart you mean your emotions, your feelings. Satan wants nothing more than for us to make our feelings our God and to base our decisions on how we feel at the moment. Many times we don't even know why we feel the way we do. Feelings are so fickle. There's no rational reason behind the way, you know, you get up and you just feel, blah, why do you feel, well, I don't know, you know. There's only one completely reliable authority in life, and that is the Word of God. 
The Bible says every part of Scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful one way or another, showing us the truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, and training us to live God's way. Through the Word, we're put together and we're shaped for the task that God has for us. It's through the Word that we become all God wants us to be. I might even say all God created us to be. The Word of God does four things, it says. It shows us the truth. It exposes our rebellion, it corrects our mistakes, and it trains us to live in the Creator's way, the way that He made us to live. And that's going to be the best way to live. We could, we could say it this way. The Bible shows us the path to walk on. It shows us when we get off that path. It shows us how to get back on the path, and it shows us how to stay on that path. So the starting point, if you really want to understand the Bible, is accepting God's Word as the authority for your life. When it contradicts culture, you're going to go with the Bible. When it contradicts tradition, you're going to go with the Bible. When it contradicts your feelings, you're going to go with the Bible. When it contradicts the things that seem reasonable, you're going to go with the Bible. When you wonder what's true, what's right, what's valuable, what you should do, the very first question you should ask, what does God say about it? I accept God's Word as my authority. Then I've got to learn to study God's Word if I'm going to grow. See, a closed Bible doesn't do any good. It'll never help me just sitting on the bookshelf or on the coffee table. It has to get into my mind and into my heart. And that doesn't happen by osmosis. You could leave the Bible under your pillow every night for a year, and you wouldn't gain any more of the Bible. It just doesn't seep into your mind. Jesus said, you carefully study the Scriptures because you think that they give you eternal life, and they do, in fact, tell of me. We're to search the Scripture, not just to read it, but to study the Scripture. The Scriptures not only tell us about Jesus, but through Him, they bring eternal life. The Holy Spirit goes on to say, work hard. So God can say to you, well done. Be a good workman, one who does not need to be ashamed. When God examines your work, know what His Word says and means. He's given it to us so we can know it and understand it. Happy are those who don't listen to the wicked, who don't go where sinners go, who don't do what evil people do. They don't follow the culture. They don't follow tradition. They love the Lord's teachings, and they think about those teachings day and night. God wants us to study so that we can know and do His will, follow His Word, and have the best life we can possibly have. Now, maybe you want to study the Word. But you just don't know how to go about it, and that's what I want to spend time about to, on, on today. I want to teach you a very simple method of Bible study that employs all the primary methods of understanding written communication. It's what the academics call uh, hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the science of interpretation. I had two teachers last night from Dallas who were here visiting, and they said, man, we've taken these notes. We're going to use them in our public school. The only one we have to leave off is pray. All the rest of them is the way, you, the way you understand written literature. They thought it was phenomenal. Every one of you can learn to study the Bible for yourself without having to depend upon pastors and teachers, without having to depend upon churches and Bible studies. With this method, you don't need any other book than the Bible. There are six steps to studying the Bible on your own. So I want to share with you, uh, you can remember them easily because the very first letter of each one spells out praise. P-R-A-I-S-E. So the first, we, right off the beginning, number one is P, pray. You ask God to forgive your sins so you can be open to his truth that, and that he would speak to you from that passage. As I read the Bible, I said it's the only book where you can also talk to the author while you're studying it. And the psalmist prayed something that you would do well to memorize, and I, I memorize it, and I say it every morning. Open my eyes, Lord, so that I can behold wondrous things from your word. Or... You know, wonderful things, this version says, from your teachings. But you, you ask God to, to give you insight, to give you understanding. Uh, you want to be teachable. You want God's help. You want his insight. Then R, P-R. R is read. Read the text very carefully. Note, never read the Bible without a pen in your hand, all right? And as you read, write down the thoughts that come to your mind. Put question marks there. Uh, put stars by it. You know, just write out the, the thoughts that come to your mind about it. Maybe something interesting, something you didn't understand, a question you might have, have about it, or a thought 
that, about how you failed to do something that it's saying right there or, or, or something that it's leading you to do, but just make some notes all over your Bible. Uh, and, and then you may want to reread it again. Sometimes a lot of, we, we, don't, we don't first grasp it the first time through, but, you know, maybe a few, pa- a few, few verses at a time. And, and then three, P-R-A, ask questions. All kinds of questions to help you interpret and understand the text. And the more questions you ask of any particular verse, the more you're going to get out of it. So you begin with those common questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Six questions, okay? Things like, who's, who's talking here? Who's speaking? Who are they speaking to? What, what are they talking about? Uh, when was this? And what happened just before this? Or what happened just after this? Or what, you know, what, what's it say right after this? Uh, why did he say it this way? Why did he say it at all? And, and if you use those six words, uh, those six questions, asking in a Bible study, you'll find the Word of God beginning to open up to you in new ways that you never experienced before. And then there are some other questions, I think, that will help you understand the passage. Uh, Rick Warren has written a book years ago called uh, Bible Study Methods, and he developed a cro- an acrostic in there to help you remember some other questions. Who, what, when, why, where, and how. It's pretty easy to remember, but some other questions to ask. How many of you remember the Jetsons? Any of you ever remember? Okay, watch this. Um, I want you to meet George Jetson. His boy, Elroy. Daughter, Judy. Jane, his wife. And then, last but not least, Astro, their dog. Now, every time you start to study the Bible, remember the Jetsons, okay? Astro is a space pet. And that's the acrostic for the questions that you need to ask of any passage of Scripture. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter what, what passage of Scripture you're reading, you can ask these questions. S, is there a sin to confess here? P, is there a promise to claim? Did you know there were 7,000 promises in the Bible? They're all waiting, just like blank checks, for you and I to claim. A, is there an attitude here that needs changing, that needs adjusting? C, in this passage, is there a command for me to obey? E, is there an example for me to follow? And, 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 and that's the space part, okay? And then pet, P, the other P, prayer. Some of you, I mean, some of the greatest prayers in the Bible the, are, are in the Bible that you can pray, some of the greatest prayers. For example, yesterday in my quiet time, I was reading in Colossians chapter 1. You look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 12, uh, 9 to 12. And you, you can't find a better pray to, prayer to pray for your family and for your friends. It's an amazing prayer. I pray that prayer all the time for people. There's gobs of them in the Psalms. Many verses that we just need to pray back to God, and we'll talk about that in a minute, for the strength to carry out, you know, that, that verse in our life. But is there a prayer there that I can pray? And then the E for pet is, is there an error for, for me to avoid? Is there something I need to, to watch out for? Is there some kind of warning there in that scripture? And then T, is there a truth there for me to believe? And when you ask these questions, you know, sin, is there a promise, an attitude, you know, command, is there an example? As you ask these questions, you'll find that with a little thought, uh, you you can understand that passage and apply it to your own life. In fact, the Bible promises that. It says, think about what I'm saying. Give it some thought. Because the Lord will enable you to understand it all. So P-R-A, the next letter is I of praise. And that stands for interpret the passage in a way that's consistent with the teaching of all the Scripture. See, every once in a while, you'll come, if you find my Bible, the one I'm using for this time, you'll find question marks every once in a while. Because you think, that can't be right. For example, let's say you're reading in 1 Corinthians and you come across... Do you not judge those who are in the church? You think, that can't be right. I just read a few weeks ago, Jesus said, do not judge others so that God will not judge you. How can God say, don't judge in one place and and we're to judge others in another place? And so you think, I better take a deeper look at both of those passages. And you read them in context. You read what, what they're talking about. You kind of look at those words. Well, what, what does judge really mean? Well, judge means you figure something out. You think about it. You make a decision about it. But it also means you, 
you condemn, uh, you criticize. And so you realize as you look at that passage, Jesus is talking about false, unrighteous, prejudiced judgment, hypercriticism. On the other hand, in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about the need to make a righteous, what Jesus calls a righteous judgment. That is a well-thought-out decision regarding sin in the church. We, we've got to maintain purity in the church at all costs. And when we discover a brother or sister openly sinning and bringing discredit on Jesus, and then we're able to confirm that sin upon investigation, we have a responsibility to go to talk to that person. Try to help them to see that sin and lead them back to, to a, a life of purity. And if they don't listen to us, if they say, well, I don't really care, then we're responsible to remove them from the fellowship, not to punish them, but to get them to realize how serious that sin is and to turn away from their sin and come back to God. But that's why it's so important for us to, to try to interpret the passage in a way that's consistent with all the rest of the Scripture because God's the author of it all. He's not going to say one thing one, one place and something else somewhere else. We've got to be able to harmonize that. And then uh, P-R-A-I-S S stands for summarize a specific and measurable application of the text to your life. See, understanding the text is only half the goal. The other half is applying it to our lives, and that's definitely the harder part. Satan really doesn't care if you read or study the Bible as long as you don't apply it to your life. In fact, Jesus said, now that you know this truth, now, now that you understand this truth, how happy you will be if you put it into practice. See, that's the goal. He didn't say you'll be happy if you know it. God didn't give us the Bible to make us smarter sinners, you know. He says you'll be blessed when you do it. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Application is when I take that truth that I now understand and I apply it to my life in a way that is personal and practical and possible and provable. Now, think about that. You, you write out what you're going to do about what you've just studied. You always write this out and, and, and because the Bible wasn't given for our information only. It was given primarily for our transformation. God is in the job of changing our hearts, changing our lives, our behavior, our conduct, our attitudes, our perspective. He wants to transform us into his image. He wants the word to become flesh again in our character and conduct. See, that's the personal part. And, and when you apply the Scripture, you always begin with the words, by God's grace, I will. And then you write it out. And it needs to be not, not only personal, but very practical. I, by God's grace, I will go to Karen and apologize. I don't know how many times that's happened when I've read the Scripture uh, through, through the years. And that's something that's personal and it's practical and Thirdly, it has to be possible. See, if you write out an application that you can't do, you're just going to get frustrated. Let's say you're reading tomorrow about a scripture on prayer, and you say, okay, by God's grace, I will pray for every person in our church every day. That's not possible. I've tried that, and you just can't do it. You can do it in a week, but you, there's no way you can do it in a day because there are too many people, unless you don't do anything else. So you've got to be realistic about your application. And finally, very important, it needs to be provable. That is measurable. You need to be able to say, I did that, or I'm doing that. You know, some applications you'll do for the rest of your life, obviously. For example, three years ago, uh, I was convicted about my sin of gluttony. You know what gluttony is? Gluttony is where you just can't stop eating, and that's, that's a huge problem for me. And so I, I became convicted about that. I wrote in my journal, and I still read it every morning because I keep a a watch out for list, and uh, every morning I read that watch out for list, and so I, one of them is watch out for overeating, and so I, I put a few things down. I'll keep my weight to 180, 185 pounds. I think back then I weighed maybe 190, uh, and I made up two or three other commitments regarding how I would eat so that I would lose some of that weight, and I'm doing that. been doing it for three years. I'll do that for the rest of my life. In, in this step, beca because I'm not doing it for me, I'm doing it for God. And it's a whole different motivation. See, a lot of times we take the Word of God and we'll read something and we'll think, well, that was nice, or that's kind of neat, or that's a good idea. But when we start doing this and, and applying it personally, practically, possibly, 
and, and provably, it, it changes our lives. You apply it to your daily life. P-R-I-S-E stands for engage with God in prayer. So we've come full circle. We opened in prayer asking God to cleanse our hearts so we'd be open to, to the truth. And, and now we pray that passage back to God, asking for his grace, his help, to carry out the application of his truth, thanking him for his power in us, for his spirit in us that enables us to be obedient and to live out the truth that we just learned. So once you've accepted the Bible as the authority for your life, you begin not only to read it, but to study it using this simple praise method, and most importantly then, you apply it in a, in a, in a personal, practical, provable, you know, possible way. You live out God's word each day. Here's the thing, if you're really serious about growing your relationship to God, getting closer to God, about building, building that relationship, you've got to be spending time with him in his word every day. You'll never build any human relationship without spending time with that, those people. You can't rely on a church, a pastor, a life group, or anything else to help you grow. You've got to feed yourself. Now, I've got some good news for you. In the back of the auditorium, we got a bunch of free booklets uh, called Next Steps in Your Walk with Jesus. And it was developed by Robert, our outreach pastor, to help new believers really begin to grow in their faith, introducing them to this praise method of Bible study. It's designed to be used for 40 consecutive days in your quiet time. It, it takes you through the scriptures, dealing with foundational principles for glow, growing closer to God. And, and even if you're not a new believer, I think it's a great tool to help you get into God's word and introduce you to this simple method of Bible study. And in the back, it, it has a 32-day plan for going through the Gospel of John. Just, you can apply this to any passage of Scripture. You're, you, know, you can just pick out a verse, and you can apply this praise method to that. I, I would ask you on the back of your connection card to make a commitment to take one of those booklets. You can also download them off our website. On the back of the outline, there's a link there. It tells you where to find it on, in our website. But spend 40 days in your quiet time reading and studying the Bible. Uh, check that if you would. Maybe you're here today, this morning, you're just checking out Christianity. You're not, you don't know if you believe all this stuff or not. And I would just encourage you to think about making the Bible the authority for your life. You know, what is the authority for your life? Consider making the Bible the authority. I decided to do that as a college student. I was going to be a lawyer. I was at the University of Missouri. And so I was interested in evidence. And uh, I, I met a Christian, and I became interested, and I started talking to them about, why do you accept the Bible as your authority? And I had no idea of all the evidence, and so I've written a, I've written a book, I mean not a book, I've written an article called, Is the Bible True? And you can get that on our website, and if, if you're just searching and you'd, you'd commit to read that, would you check that on the back, back of your connection card and turn those connection cards in? The guys are going to be coming after my prayer, collecting those while we're singing the closing song, and, and or you can just put them in those... Uh, uh, boxes, those wall boxes right, right back there by the doors as you go out. Uh, let's bow in prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. We don't want to be spiritual babies. We want to grow. We don't want to have to be spoon-fed by other people. We want to learn to feed ourselves on your word. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that. You said it's our bread for life, that it's our spiritual soul food, that it's what builds us up. It's what draws us closer to you. So, Father, help us each to practice what we've learned today, not just so we'll know more, but so that we'll draw closer and closer to you. In Jesus' name.